Welcome back. Um, today we're going to talk about m matter. Now matter is uh, different than energy, right? The two things in the universe are matter and energy. Matter would be anything that has mass and occupies space, so it's the stuff around us. And even though matter seems extremely smooth and continuous, I mean you, you touch the, the screen of your smartphone and it seems nice and smooth, and yet it's actually made of tiny little atoms and molecules. Okay, I think of these as kind of tiny little spheres or, you know, kind of like nerds, you know, how they're all bumpy and, you know, sometimes joined together, sometimes jostle around. Um, you know, I keep mine inside of a bottle so that I don't eat all of them because that would be cannibalism. Um, anyway, so what are the states of matter? Well, these are what we're familiar with, solids, liquids, and gases. And um, there are other states of matter, Bose-Einstein condensates and, you know, plasmas and so forth, but these are the common ones, and this is what we're going to discuss. So, what is a solid? Well, we're pretty familiar with this. Solids have a definite shape and a definite volume. So if I have a big block of granite, it's going to sit there and remain a big block of granite. It's not going to suddenly morph or shift or change shape or you know suddenly expand. Now the reason for this is if we zoom in at the molecular level, the atoms or molecules are tightly packed together. They can't really move around. Um, they can vibrate in position but because they're so tightly packed, they really don't have anywhere to go. And they don't have enough energy to you know, break free of those, those attractive forces and slide past each other. Also, because these are so tightly packed, they have a very high density, and they're not easily compressed. Now, there are actually two different types of solids. We have crystalline solids, in which the particles are arranged in nice, orderly, geometric patterns. You can think of like a, a diamond or maybe you know a large sh uh, salt crystal. So each of the ions or atoms or molecules are are nice and um, ordered. Now on the other hand, amorphous solids are still solids, but they don't always behave exactly as solids. Uh, think of something like silly putty, right? You make a, a statue of your favorite chemistry professor, and um, <laughs> you know over time it's going to kind of morph and n almost melt into you know a big blob all right and that's because these amorphous solids don't have a nice orderly geometric pattern okay they you know the molecules aren't quite so ordered so what about liquids all right liquids um, don't have a definite shape so they'll take the shape of whatever container they're in so let's say that you have you know a, a big glass of lemonade um, it's shaped like the glass itself if you pour that into a you know kitchen sink, it will be shaped like the kitchen sink. It'll always uh, shift and take the shape of whatever you want. Um, now they do have a, a definite and specific volume. So um, you know if you have a gallon of milk, it will always be a gallon, no matter whether you pour it into a bathtub, whether you pour it on your brother's head. It doesn't matter. It'll still always have you know a volume of one gallon. Now the particles, if we could zoom in again to the atomic level we would see that the particles are tightly packed together, but they have enough freedom to slide past each other and to kind of move uh, and meld past each other. This allows things like, you know, ducks with funny hairdos to, you know, kind of swim through the water because the water molecules are able to slide past one another. This wouldn't work in a solid because there's no, you know, way for something to move through there. Now, they are still, remember, tightly packed, so they still have a relatively high density, usually not as high as that of solids, and they're also not compressible, just like solids. Now, um, what about gases? Okay, gases don't have a definite shape or a definite volume. They will take the shape and volume of what, whatever container they're in. Right, so in this case, let's say you're at a birthday party, and um, you know your daughter blows out the candles, and those little particles of smoke you know they they're floating around in the gas in the air around us and they will actually spread out until they fill the the shape and volume of the room that they're in same thing happens when you spritz a little perfume at the the front of a you know an auditorium eventually those gas molecules will bounce around and they will eventually you know go to all sides of the auditorium now gases have particles that are extremely far apart okay there's so much space in between these things so, for instance, you may have just a few little gas molecules that are spread out, and yet the, the space between them is extremely large. And these gas molecules are constantly moving around 
and bouncing around in constant random motion. And it turns out that because there's so much space between them, the gases have extremely low densities. And they also are extremely compressible. You can take a balloon and you can squeeze it down. So you can force the molecules to become a little more tightly packed uh, because, again, they have so much free space between them, which is very different from liquids and uh, solids. So what are the actual building blocks that make up solids, liquids, and gases? Well, these are atoms and molecules. So atoms are the actual particles that make up elements. So when we think of the periodic table, which we'll discuss in great and glorious detail, uh, you know, the periodic table is made up of the elements. So atoms um, are made of are what make up elements, and these are the building blocks of all matter. Now, once you actually take atoms, let's say, you know, a hydrogen atom and an oxygen atom and another hydrogen atom, and you join them together, now you have what we call a molecule. These are the particles that make up compounds. And we'll discuss the different types of compounds. Now, these molecules are held together by what we call bonds. Okay, so here we have a bond between uh, the hydrogen, each hydrogen, and the oxygen. And there are different types of bonds that, again, we'll go into, into detail about. So all of matter can be classified or into uh, different subcategories. So matter has to be either a pure substance or a mixture. Now, as the name implies, a pure substance is pure. So you can think of something like um, pure gold or pure water or pure table salt, right? All of these are pure substances. They do not have anything else in them. Mixtures, on the other hand, obviously have multiple things uh, physically combined together. This could be something as simple as um, sand mixed with iron filings, or it could be something like, uh, you know, bacon cheeseburger at Wendy's, right? You have different things that have been uh, mixed together. Now, um, mixtures can be physically separated. Right, so if I have that mixture of sand and iron filings, I could just take a magnet and I could pull out all of the iron filings. I could physically separate it. Okay, if I have a seven-layer burrito at Taco Bell, um, I could open it up and I could scoop out you know, the rice or the beans or the guacamole or whatever. I could physically separate those. Now, um, pure substances can be either elements or compounds. The easiest way to tell is to pull out your periodic table, which I'm sure you all carry with you at all times, and um, check to see whether the, you know, the substance in question is on the periodic table. If it is, it's an element. If it's not, it's a compound. So in other words, if, um, if I say aluminum, you look up on the periodic table, and aluminum, or aluminium, which is how they say it everywhere else, which sounds much cooler, is, uh, it's found on the periodic table. So it's what we call an element. Uh, something like water, it's a pure substance, but it's not a compound. It's not found on the periodic table, and it's actually made of hydrogen and oxygen, right? H2O. So it's made of two different elements chemically combined together. Now, how is a compound different than a mixture? I mean, they both contain two or more substances. The difference is that mixtures are physically combined, which means they can be physically separated. Compounds are chemically combined, which means that they have to be chemically separated. So, for instance, table salt is sodium and chlorine, right? Sodium chloride. And so there's no physical way to just take some tweezers and pluck off each of the, the chlorine um, you know, atoms or ions. It's, it's impossible. So that would make it a compound. Now, um, mixtures can be one of two things. They can either be heterogeneous or homogeneous. Hetero meaning different, right? And homo meaning the same. So if it looks the same throughout, it's what we call a homogeneous mixture. So for instance, something like apple juice, right? It's made of water and vitamin C, sugar, and all the different flavorings and so forth. And so that would be a homogeneous mixture because it's a mixture, has multiple things in it, but it looks the same. You can't look at it and say, oh, there's some vitamin C right there. Oh, yep, I see it over there. There's the sugar. No, it's, it's all the same. Whereas if I um, say something like, um, I don't know, uh, you know, a pepperoni pizza, then that would be a heterogeneous mixture because you could easily see the difference between the pepperoni and the cheese and the sauce and the crust, and you could pull off 
you know, individual pieces. So let's go ahead and, and try practicing classifying a few things as either elements, compounds, heterogeneous, or homogeneous mixtures. So let's say um, I say sugar. So sugar, table sugar is C12H22O11. So first off, we know it's not a mixture, right? So right off the bat, it can't be a mixture because it's just pure sugar. Now, it's either an element or a compound. Well, it's got to be a compound because notice that it has carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and it has three different elements chemically combined and hooked together. So that must be a compound. Now let's try another one. How about um, something like, how about coffee? A coffee, let's see. Well, um, it's a mixture because it has multiple things in it, right? It has caffeine and tannic acids and sugar and um, maybe some cream. Maybe it's got, you know, um, it's definitely got water and so forth in there. But is it heterogeneous or is it homogeneous? Does it look the same throughout or does it look different? Well, um, if it's just regular coffee, it would be a homogeneous mixture. What if it's an iced coffee? Well, then you can definitely see the ice cubes in there. And so it doesn't look the same, in which case it would be a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, how about um, how about silver? Right. So you buy yourself something that's pure silver. Well, it's just silver, so it's got to be a pure substance. Now, if we look at our periodic table, silver is definitely an element. There's nothing else mixed with it, so it must be just a, just a pure element. It's not too bad. Now that we know how to classify matter, let's go ahead and talk about some of the properties of matter, some of the characteristics. Well, there are two different types, physical and chemical properties. Physical or easy, these are the things that you can directly observe. This would be something like color or taste or smell or the mass or the weight or the, you know, the size, the shape, so forth. You, you know, things that you can directly observe and you can measure them without actually changing the, the nature of the substance itself, right? If I look at the, the color of a marker, it doesn't suddenly change anything about the marker. I just see what color it is. Chemical properties, on the other hand, definitely um, change or attempt to change the nature of the substance itself in order to actually um, you know, measure the chemical property. This would be something like flammability, right? If I take, I don't know, a newspaper and I uh, go ahead and, and attempt to burn it, right? it's definitely going to change the nature of what it is. It's no longer going to be a newspaper. Or if I take you know, a piece of metal and I drop it in a vat of acid, and I test to see whether it will react with acid. Whether or not it reacts with acid is a chemical property because I'm attempting to change the chemical nature of the, uh, the substance itself. Now, let's go ahead and try this out. So you tell me, physical or chemical property? So we know the iron rusts when you expose it to oxygen. Well, it's no longer iron, right? It has changed into rust, into iron oxide. So that would have to be a chemical property. All right, what about the fact that sugar dissolves in water? Hmm, well, it looks different, but have we actually changed what it is? No, I mean, if you taste it, it's still sugar, right? We haven't done anything about the actual nature of the substance, so that would be a physical property. What about the fact that salt, table salt, is white? It's got to be a physical property, right? You can observe it without changing anything about the, the nature of what it is. Okay, what about water boiling at 100 degrees Celsius? Well... It's changed, but have we changed the, the actual substance itself? Have we changed what it is? No, it started out as H2O, liquid, and now it's H2O, vapor. It's the same thing, though, right? So it has to be a physical property. What about the fact that aluminum produces hydrogen gas and aluminum chloride when you add it to hydrochloric acid? Well, in that case, it's definitely a chemical property. We've changed or attempted to change what it is. What about copper conducting electricity? Is it copper at the beginning of the day? Is it copper at the end? Yes. We haven't changed anything except tested whether it could actually conduct electricity. What about the fact that if you are, um, you know, you go ahead and run an electrical current through molten salt, it'll actually turn into a gray metal and a yellow-green gas? Well, in that case, that's definitely a chemical property. 
Um, it's also a really good way to get out of a blind date, right? We've all had these. You're sitting at a restaurant and you just cannot wait to, to get home and get away from this person. And you're thinking, why did I ever agree to, to go on this blind date? And so here's the plan. You pull out your, uh, your purse, right? Or your man bag. And you suddenly uh, reach in and you pull out, you know, eight or ten uh, car batteries. Because we, we all carry them. And you actually, you know, connect these on the series. You attach the, the electrodes to the salt shaker. And you run an electrical current through this. And eventually you'll actually produce... Um, you know, uh, chlorine gas, which is a toxic yellow-green gas, and, you know, people start to choke and gasp, and then you pick up the, the blob of gray metal, which is actually sodium, which reacts with, violently with water and is explosive, and you throw that into your, your date's water glass, and it explodes, and then in the, the ensuing commotion, you crawl and sneak out the bathroom window. See? Brilliant. <laughs> actually, a really bad idea. I don't recommend you do that at all. Okay, since I'm already kind of off in Bizarro Land, uh, it's random story time. <laughs> so, um, a while back, my kids decided that they were really into collecting coins, right? Coins, uh, we're all kind of pack rats, right? And so we like to collect weird things. And it turns out that they wanted to collect a coin from every country in the world. And I thought, oh, that's kind of fun, right? Teach them some geography. And so we'd go to this little coin store, and, you know, we'd, they'd pay a quarter. They'd reach into this bucket, and they'd pull out a coin, and then we'd take it home and we'd figure out, you know, which country it's from. And it was kind of fun to put a little star on the map of Mexico or a star on, you know, um, I don't know, Zimbabwe. And it was kind of a fun little activity. And then I started to think about it and I was like, well, um, one quarter per country. And there's like 300 countries in the world. And, you know, then I've got three kids. And so they each want a coin from each of the countries. And that's a lot of quarters, right? That's a lot of money. So I went on eBay, and I bought, you know, this big, um, you know, thing of coal coins, right? Just the junk coins that they were trying to get rid of, you know, kind of like when the Europe switched to the euro and so forth. And um, got this big batch, 10 pounds of coins for 50 bucks, including shipping. And we start to go through it with this coin catalog, and we figure out, like, oh, this is from Tanzania, and this is from, um, you know, I don't know, this is from... Lithuania and so forth. It was kind of a fun little activity. And then we came across one coin that I couldn't quite figure out what it is. And my kids were like, oh, can we have this? It looks like a, you know, some kind of Chuck E. Cheese token or something. And so I couldn't figure out what it was. Um, but I figured that I'd look through the, the little um, you know, coin catalog some more. It wasn't in there. Finally, I Googled it. And this is the coin over here. And it turns out that it's a, a medal from Israel about the Israeli uh, liberation, and from the 1950s. And guess what it's made of? Gold, right? Pure gold. And so I was like, hmm, this is great. If it's real, I mean, it could be a fake or something. And so um, what do you do? Well, you got to test some properties about it. So the first thing I did was I know, the, I know the density of gold, and so I decided to go ahead and test the density. So density is a physical property, right, which means that I can... I can uh, measure it without actually changing the coin itself, without changing, hopefully, the gold that it's made out of. So I, I get the mass and the volume, and I calculate the density, and, oh, sure enough, it seems to match up with the density of pure gold. Hmm, interesting. Well, um, let's go ahead and look at some other things. So what else do we know about gold? Well, I knew some of the chemical properties, right? I know that it doesn't react with nitric acid. It's one of the few... Um, metals that, that won't react with nitric acid. So I poured a little beaker of nitric acid and I stuck it in and nothing happened. So that's a chemical property because I was attempting to change the actual nature of the substance. And if it had been made of you know, um, iron or copper or something, it definitely would have react with the, reacted with the nitric acid. And so then I thought, wow, this is great. You know, it may just be gold plated or whatever, but it seems like it's definitely pure gold. So I took it to a jeweler, and they tried to offer me like 200 bucks for it. I was like, no way. And then I, I took it to a, a coin show, sold it for a whole lot more than that. And so, again, you know, these physical and chemical properties can definitely come in handy. So totally true story from a couple of years back. So the moral of the story is obviously to uh, check the change in your pocket. And also, when your kids want to start a new hobby... Uh, do it with them. You might just, uh, you know, make some good money on it. 
and have lots of fun. So now when we're talking about uh, properties and you know chemical and physical, we also have to talk about physical and chemical changes, and these directly correlate with the properties themselves. So a physical change is going to alter how the substance looks without changing what it is. So something like melting an ice cube. It started out as H2O. It's now you know liquid H2O. We could boil it and turn it into um, you know a gas or a vapor, and it's still H2O. So that would be a physical change. Or dissolving something in water, right? Another physical change. Or um, you know breaking it into pieces. Again, a physical change. Now, what about a chemical change? Well, a chemical change is something where you're converting one substance into another. So it's no longer, you know, um, I don't know, if you have a piece of aluminum foil, you drop it into hydrochloric acid and it starts to bubble. Um, it changes what it is. It's no longer aluminum. It's now turned into aluminum chloride and so forth. So um, let me give you some examples. Let's say that you go to Egypt, right? Because I've always wanted to visit Egypt and I have never been there. And so let's say you decide to visit the Sphinx and you want to bring home, you know, a souvenir for your favorite chemistry professor. And so uh, you decide, you know what? I bet he would really like a piece of the Sphinx. So you wait till no one's looking. You run past the guards and you go and you, you know, take your little rock hammer and you break off a chunk of the Sphinx. All right. Um, now, is that a physical or a chemical change? Well, it's physical, right? Because the Sphinx, the, the limestone, the calcium carbonate itself, hasn't changed. It is still calcium carbonate, but now it's in two pieces, right? And you're in jail, so don't do it. But um, now, on the other hand, let's say that you are a, um, you know, some kind of Sphinx terrorist, and you go running up there with some hydrochloric acid, and you throw it on the Sphinx, and it starts to bubble away and turn into carbon dioxide gas. In that case, it would be a chemical change because it's no longer calcium carbonate. It is now carbon dioxide gas, and you, you know, change the substance itself and you're still in jail. Um, other examples would be, let's say, that you turn in a, a report and it's horrible, so I rip it into little pieces of paper. Well, that's still a physical change because it's still paper. But if it's so bad that I have to actually burn it, okay, in that case, it's a chemical change because it's no longer paper at the end of the day. I've chemically changed it into carbon dioxide and soot. So let's try a little pop quiz here. You tell me, physical or chemical change? Well. Let's say that you're trying to make caramel and you, you heat it, the sugar so much that it turns black. Is it caramel at the end of the day? Is it sugar? No, you've chemically changed what it is. So that would be a, I mean, if you taste it, it's actually like charcoal at this point. So that would be a chemical change. Melting an ice cube, physical change, right? You should probably write these down just in case. All right, so we've got a chemical change. And this would be a physical change. What about making a baking soda volcano? That would be a chemical change, right? Because you produced carbon dioxide, you've changed what it is. It's no longer vinegar and baking soda at the end of the day. What about cracking an egg? Well, in that case, it's a physical change, right? It looks different, but it's still an egg. Okay. What about um, when you go and get like a vaccine or something and they rub that little um, alcohol swab on you and the, the rubbing alcohol evaporates and it feels all cool? All right, so that is a physical change because it's still rubbing alcohol. It's just now in the gas phase rather than in the liquid phase. What about metabolizing food? Well, is it still, you know, an apple at the end of the day? Um, no. So in that case, it would be a chemical change. Now, if we're talking about matter, one of the most important rules or laws that um, deals with matter is the law of conservation of mass. Now, this is an idea that um, you know few people have had, but uh, most famously Antoine Lavoisier, who is a, a French chemist, um, actually came up with this idea and expressed it that matter is neither created nor destroyed in a chemical reaction. Okay, he was actually doing experiments where he would take things like uh, mercury oxide and he would heat it up and turn it into mercury liquid, you know, the the metal and oxygen gas. Um, not a new experiment. People had been doing this for years. The difference was that Lavoisier had actually uh, measured everything, all the reactants and all the products. So he would perform this in a very controlled environment, in which case he would actually capture all of the gas that was released and so forth. And he would weigh things before and after. And he always found 
that the mass of the reactants exactly equaled the mass of the products. So you couldn't create or destroy anything in a normal chemical reaction. You can reorganize it and change how it looks, but it has to be the same amount. So thanks, Antoine Lavoisier. Uh, for, unfortunately, he was actually um, beheaded by guillotine during the French Revolution. So um, kind of a sad story there. Now, let me ask you a question then. If this law is true, let's say that you have some seeds. So I like to collect random seeds. Uh, I have a couple of them here. So um, these ones here are from um, a, a giant sequoia. Right, so these things get to be massively, massively, massively huge, right? Like hundreds of tons. And yet they start out with seeds that are just, you know, I don't know, 10 milligrams or so. So where does all the extra mass come from? Well, does it come from the soil? Well, not much of it. Otherwise, every time you plant a seed, you know, and you had this tree grow, you'd have this massive crater around it where all of the, you know, the soil had somehow been sucked up into the tree. Does it come from water? Well, part of it, right? Because the trees do contain a lot of water. But the vast majority of the mass actually comes from carbon dioxide gas. So the trees actually uptake the carbon dioxide, turn it into cellulose and glucose and other things, and actually make the tree out of this. So it's not actually, uh, you know, somehow creating matter. It's actually just taking the carbon dioxide and the air around it and converting that into a different type of matter, right? So it looks different. And then what about if you decide to uh, burn the tree, right? Well, then all of that carbon dioxide, um, c you know, all that, uh, you know, carbon goes back into carbon dioxide gas, goes back out into the atmosphere. So um, the, the matter will never be created nor destroyed. These are actually bristlecone uh, pine seeds, the oldest living creatures on the planet. So it can be like 5,000 years old. And these are Victoria water lilies, which are these amazing water lilies that can grow to be like eight meters across and can support like 300 pounds. So you could like lay on these things. Pretty amazing. Anyway, totally random. But since we're going off on a random thing, let me go ahead and show you um, a quick illustration of Law of Conservation of Mass. All right, so Law of Conservation of Mass. If I take a deck of cards and I go ahead and just, you know, start mixing it up, I have a certain number of cards in here, and I cannot, you know, create or destroy any new cards, right? But well, I'm going to go ahead and have you choose a card since you're not um, here, can't reach through the screen. I'm going to go ahead and choose one for you. How about this one, the Eight of Hearts, okay, right here on top. So you can clearly see it, and now we're going to go ahead and mix these up a little bit more. And now I'm going to have you go ahead and look for your card. Okay, I'll spread them out here on the table. Um, that's not working so well, um, but let's go ahead and mix these up. I'll start going through here. You let me know if you see the Eight of Hearts. Can you see that okay? Kind of awkward trying to do this in front of a camera. All right, so your card's not in here, right? So somehow I've destroyed your card, um, which of course is physically impossible. Antoine Lavoisier would be very upset. So instead, your card has to be in here. In fact, it's right here inside the card box. I must not have pulled it out. So obviously, there's your card. So this, again, illustrates um, law of conservation of mass or law of conservation of matter because the card cannot be created nor destroyed. It has to be there somewhere. Now, one final thing that doesn't really seem to tie in with this section, but in some ways it does, is temperature, all right? So temperature is important because it's a measure of how hot, you know, an object is. Not like uh, Keanu Reeves versus Brad Pitt or Jennifer Aniston or, you know, whoever, whatever, okay? Um, it's not a measure of that hotness. It's a measure of how, like, the temperature-wise, right, how hot or cold an object actually is. So there are three temperature scales that are going to be used. Um, degrees Fahrenheit, which is used in the United States, not used really anywhere else, it's not very common, and it's not really useful because it's kind of weird. It has um, weird numbers, right? Like water freezes at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, um, it boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, not commonly used, unfortunately, um, here in the U.S. it is, but everywhere else it's not. So 
What about degrees Celsius? This is what we'll commonly use in a chemistry lab. And this is really nice because water happens to freeze at exactly zero degrees Celsius and boil at 100 degrees Celsius, which makes it really nice and convenient. And then the last temperature scale would be Kelvin. So Kelvin is an absolute temperature scale, which means that you can never actually get to zero Kelvin. You can never get like a negative Kelvin. You can get, you know, it can be really cold outside and be negative 20 degrees Celsius or negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but it can never be negative 20 Kelvin because, you know, at zero Kelvin is when all, um, all, you know, molecular motion would completely cease and so forth. One other quick note, and it doesn't really matter, but some people, you know, get upset by this. We talk about degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Celsius, but you never say degrees Kelvin. We just say, oh, it's 250 Kelvin. So when it comes to temperature, we have to know how to convert between the, the different temperature scales. So the first formula that you should know is the um, Fahrenheit and Celsius conversion. So I, I've written it out in two different ways, one going from Celsius into Fahrenheit and the other going from uh, Fahrenheit into Celsius. You'll notice if you like algebra that they're the exact same formula, so you really only need one of them, but some people like to have both of them written out. So let's go ahead and try using this. Let's say that you know, you're in third grade, you've got a big spelling test coming up you know, that day, and you don't want to go because you didn't study, right? And so you pretend you're sick, so you grab the thermometer, and um, you stick it in the microwave or something to heat it up. And you know, when you pull it out, you'll, you notice that it's, it's set in Celsius, right? And you're like, oh, crap. But your mom suddenly walks in and you're like, oh yeah, I'm sick. Here, look at my temperature. I have a temperature of, um, I don't know, something like um, 75 degrees Celsius. Oh, see, I, I think I'm really, really sick. Your mom's like, oh wow, that's interesting. Um, why don't you head up to bed and I will go ahead and get you some soup. And while she's doing that, she pulls out her calculator and she converts this. And she says, all right, 1.8 times 75 plus 32 and so as she walks back upstairs she you know is dragging something with her and she walks into your room and you're like what's that and you, she says oh it's a coffin because um, you have a temperature of 167 degrees Fahrenheit obviously you're dead so either get in the coffin or go to school and so you go to school and you take your spelling test so we could um, easily do this the other direction as well if we wanted to. I could give you a temperature. Um, let's say we said that water boils at um, 212 degrees Fahrenheit, right? So 200, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's go ahead and try converting that to Celsius. So parentheses, 212 minus 32 divided by 1.8. That'll give us our temperature in Celsius. So 212 minus 32, and then divide that answer by 1.8. Well, it comes out to exactly 100 degrees Celsius. So I wasn't lying. Um, 100 degrees Celsius is the same thing as 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, what if you wanted to go ahead and convert something into um, Kelvin? Well, it's actually really, really easy as long as it's in Celsius. So if I wanted to take this and convert that to Kelvin, the Kelvin temperature is equal to the degrees Celsius, in this case, 100, plus 273, which comes out to 373 Kelvin. Okay. If you want to go the opposite direction, obviously you just take the Kelvin and, and subtract uh, 273 from it, and that would give you the, the temperature in degrees Celsius. All right. Now, what if I were pr feeling particularly evil? and I wanted to give you a temperature in Fahrenheit and ask you to convert it to Kelvin, right? So let's say that I tell you it's 151 degrees Fahrenheit and say, yeah, convert that to Kelvin, why don't you? And so you're like, oh, well, it's actually pretty easy, right? First, I'm going to go ahead and use this formula to change it into cel degrees Celsius, and then I'll use this to change it into um, Kelvin, right? So let's go ahead and do that real quick. So I'm going to take 151 minus 32, divide that by 1.8. So 
So 151 minus 32, divide that answer by 1.8, comes out to about 66 um, degrees Celsius. And now to get Kelvin, it's going to be equal to 66 plus 273. which is equal to about 339 Kelvin. So 151 degrees Fahrenheit is 339 Kelvin. So nice work today. Um, as we talk about matter, um, I'll see you in the next section.